this this is the the cover of the current book and believe me in taking these books you're supporting the research work really because hey guys there's no money in, in spiritualist history you were saying about david thompson i was very lucky because i was secretary and president of my home city of york and i was able to organize many seances with david it was, it was like it was only a two-year period but we did like four a year. So we had a lot of experiences. And of course, we sat with him in Shropshire. And I organized seances for Stuart Alexander, uh, Bill Meadows, and, and other people. So there's a great book to be written on <laughs> the seance organizer, memoirs of, but that's a different book. And in fact, I've written four books, and I'm currently working on a fifth book on the topic of American spiritualism in the mid 20th century. What I wanted to do is take a look at the photograph. This photograph was given to me by the Reverend Kevin Lee, in, uh, who lives in Fort Lauderdale, spiritualist minister. And it's a studio portrait. And there's a lot about this, a lot about this photograph. If you look at the line of her mouth, it's quite decided. If you look at her eyes, they're very steady. She looks at the camera. She engages the, the camera. But her presentation is elegant. It's formal. It, it's, it, she was a woman who enjoyed looking well. Um, she was a businesswoman. And for the first 20 years of her working life, she ran a, a beauty salon in Anderson in Indiana. And she was a milliner. And as you know, a milliner is someone who makes hats. And it's my theory, and I can't prove this at all, that she made this hat. <laughs> so this is a woman, if you look at her, she has character. This is a woman of style. This is a businesswoman. And Ethel was a wonderful physical medium. And she was an all-round medium. This photograph, Ethel was born in... a in Indiana in the 1880s. Now, as her biographer, you think, hey, I should know when she was born. In fact, I ran uh, an appendix on the various dates that she gave throughout her life. So the best you can say is that she was probably born in 1886, could have been as early as 1882. This photograph was taken in 1925 in August in in Camp Chesterfield in Indiana. Again, you can see that characterful, steady look. She wasn't a woman who was given to smiling in photographs. There was a journalist in, uh, who ran a series of articles on, Ethel, on Camp Chesterfield, which involved Ethel Poe's parish. It was a hostile journalist, but like a lot of uh, journalists, they record details that spiritualists overlook how much it cost, that kind of thing, how many people were at the seances, what the conditions were, things like that, that spiritualists tend not to focus on too much. And in fact, the journalist Virginia Swain, who, um, who died in 1969, she made a career, she launched her career by running, a, in quotes, an expose of fraudulent mediumship at Camp Silver Bell, uh, sorry, at Camp Chesterfield. And Ethel, she actually recorded the first seance with Ethel Post Parish so that we know of. And Ethel, there was a phenomenon in America called Trumpet in the Light, which I don't think is done in, very much anywhere anymore. You know, those aluminium trumpets. So imagine, will you, an audience of three, 400 people sitting in the auditorium. It's as hot as hell in Indiana in summer. Ethel is sitting on the, on the, in a chair and the, she calls the people come up from the audience to get a message from spirit side. She holds the fat end of the trumpet to her throat and the, the, the narrow end of the aluminium trumpet, I guess you all know what a trumpet is, the narrow end of the trumpet goes to the recipient's ear. Um, the, the, the journalist, Virginia Swain, recorded the various conversations people had with the spirit side. And there was an old farmer, and he's talking to his mini in spirit side, and he's asking after the boys and whether he should make this investment. Now, the journalist said, well, I saw her lips move. 
But however, there was an, any number of people went up and experienced trumpet in the light. So we would understand that in broad daylight, Ethel is materializing a voice box in order to project down this trumpet into the recipient's ear. In fact, 14 mediums were arrested, uh, but not Ethel, funnily enough. And they were charged with obtaining money under false pretense. They appeared in court and the judge said anybody who takes a dollar with the idea that they're going to be put in touch with the, with the dead is a fool. And he threw the case out. In America, of course, you have a constitutional right to practice the religion of your choice. So a lot of court cases, and there was a lot of harassment of spiritualist mediums in America, invariably the cases were thrown out of court. Unfortunately, we can't see. This is Myron's, Myron Post. He was the third president. Uh, sorry, a big one. He was the president of, Camp, of the Association of Camp Chesterfield, and he was... Ethel's third husband. She married four times altogether. Myron was a successful businessman. Myron was a lawyer. He'd been a judge. He'd been an administrator in the Legislative Assembly. At, and he became president of Camp Chesterfield. So he was quite an experienced business executive. And her, Ethel's first two husbands probably weren't that successful, and she moved on. This is a woman of the early 19th century. There weren't a lot of career options open to women in that, in, of that generation. Secretarialship with the introduction of typewriters, things like that. And, of course, Ethel ran her own businesses in the town of Anderson, which is close to Camp Chesterfield. She moved into Camp Chesterfield in 1990. Now, this is Ethel. This is a bit blurred, this one. This is Ethel and, and, and Myron at Camp Chesterfield in the mid-1920s. This is Anna Dennis. It's her aunt. You know, I, I am a medium, and I do pick up impressions. Anna Dennis ran the Lyceum at Camp Chesterfield, and almost certainly she was Ethel Post Parish's circle leader in the, her development. She first sat for development in 1919, probably with, uh, with her husband, Myron, and a couple of others, Pat. And she first, the first demonstration, her first public works were at Camp Chesterfield in 1924, when she demonstrated billets. I don't know if, uh, I'll come back to that. And in 1925, there was that report written about her direct voice trumpet and the light mediumship. Anna Dennis was an aunt by marriage. And this wonderful photograph is a group photograph of the mediums at Camp Chesterfield. Now, if you look at the gentleman in the middle there, that's Myron Post, which is Ethel's third husband. To his right is Mabel Riffle. And behind Myron stands Ethel. If you look at Ethel's face, this isn't a woman who was given to much smiling, really. This is a woman of determination. This was a woman of ex who had a real executive ability. When I was researching her biography, of course, we have access to other sources. We, the thing that I most got in my mind was, and the messages we received about it, but Ethel wanted to be remembered for all of her life, not simply for her mediumship. On the far right, of, at the back, you can see her Aunt Dennis there again. You can move the picture around a bit. Uh, there's a number of physical mediums here. On the far right is E.W. Hart and his, his circle leader, Pal Joey Pal. <laughs> I've forgotten his name. But he was circle leader to this guy. And the orchestra in the front, uh, the Exie Hardy Girls. You know, in the 1920s, lady jazz bands were all the rage. But these girls provided all the music at Camp Chesterfield. They did jazz, they did sacred songs, they did music for seances, etc., etc. Mabel Riffle, well, unfortunately, Mabel uh, turned out to be a bit of a villain. At the age of 82, in 1961, she staged a fraudulent materialization circle at Camp Chesterfield. 
Mabel was a very capable executive businesswoman and she built up Camp Chesterfield from something that was disorganized and ran down into an international center for physical mediumship. But the standards were always mixed. There was excellent mediumship in Camp Chesterfield, including Mabel Riffle herself, who was a direct voice medium. This is Mabel Riffle. Mabel Riffle, Ethel Post Parish, and a bit later we have another slide, uh, Francine Harwood Dorge were cousins. The whole clan, Anna Dennis, who we looked at earlier, her photograph, who was Ethel's circle leader, they were a family group in, in, who sort of came to dominate the life of Camp Chesterfield. Mabel Riffle was secretary of Camp Chesterfield from 1908 to 1961 when she died. In other words, it became her fiefdom. Uh, as we know, often when people dominate an organization for too long, they become corrupted by the power that they yield. It, almost certainly she lost her abilities of physical mediumship in the 1950s and turned to fraud. But there was no doubt, nevertheless, that she was in her time a very good physical medium and she was also a very capable executive. This is uh, Ethel and Mabel's younger cousin, Franch and Harwood Dorsch. Not a very, uh, uh, no, she looks a bit uh, unpleasant there, I think. In fact, in a lot of uh, her pictures, she's really quite smiling and charming. Franch and Harwood Dorsch, there is a book about her actually. Um, Franch was a very capable physical medium. And her materialization uh, seances were, were very hard to get into at Camp Chesterfield. She always stayed at Camp Chesterfield. She was 10 years younger than Ethel and, you know, and 15 years younger than Mabel Riffle, but she died rather young in 1966. But she, so you've got a family there. You've got Mabel Riffle, you've got Ethel Post Parish, you've got French and Har Harwood Dorsch, who were all physical mediums. And in my research for my new book on uh, American mediumship, I have got an appendix of 164, 164 direct voice and trumpet medium. I'm not authenticating their claims. However, those between, say, 1930, 1970, 164 direct voice and physical mediums in America. This, <clears throat> what happened was that um, you were brought up, the, the, the mediums were trained, ordained at the different camps in America. Uh, in, in the, in the mid-1930s, there was something like 30, 32 to 34 camps. I need to explain really what a camp was. A camp was really a residential community that had, uh, that, that had summer visitors to them. Uh, in America, you know, you could form communities around certain ideas. Nowadays, you get golf or you get gay communities or you get retirees and they come together and they live in communities dedicated to doing uh, Mormonism or whatever it is. And it was the same with the spiritualists. They formed their own communities, which they called camps. And there are still, I believe, about 10 spiritualist camps in the United States today. The, uh, the best known, of course, is Lilydale in upstate New York. This Catholic church is in Miami and it's in Southwest 6th Street. And in 1928, Ethel realized, Ethel and Myron decided they were going to leave Camp Chesterfield because Ethel would only ever be one of a stable of mediums. She wanted to found her own center. She wanted to break out and start something of her own. And they bought a building on this land and they had this, the, the church still exists as a Catholic church, as you can see, but unusually for Florida, it has a basement and that basement was used for seances. The water table in Florida is very high, so you very rarely get basements. The only problem was, as uh, Ethel was to discover, Miami is very hot. 
the humidity is off the scale, really. So the season for practicing physical manifestations is really only October through to uh, January, March, uh, into spring. And then it's just too hot to sit in a dark room. And of course, uh, air conditioning, A, it's noisy, and B, it wasn't invented till the, until the 1950s. The church actually survived from, it was founded in 1928, the, it was called the Spiritual Temple of Truth, and School of Truth. And it survived from 1928 up to the 1960s under different man spiritualist management. This is Ethel in 1929. What a decided look she had, did not she? Uh, she looks directly at the camera. This woman was nobody's fool. I liked Ethel. I think she, she was feisty. If you were loyal to her, she was loyal to you. I mean, she married four times, nevertheless. But she made lifelong friends. And those friends were very loyal to her. And she was loyal to them. Ethel, in 1929, this was a landmark occasion, was invited by the Ontario Society for Psychical Research to sit for them in Kitchener up in Ontario. So you, you can imagine, can't you, the, uh, Myron and Ethel in their Model T Ford get off and drive down the back roads of America 600 miles to Kitchener in Ontario. And what the, uh, the, there is one account you can find quite easily on the internet, but there, there were five or six seances held for the society. Um, what they did was they stitched a, a cloth jute sack, you know, they stitched up this very large sack and they sewed ethyl into this sack. And nevertheless, the materializations material came forward out of the sack. Uh, Silver Bell, Joseph Banks, her spiritual teacher. And the society wrote up a report endorsing the sittings that they had with Ethel as being authentic. And it was something that she valued all her life. Um, a British, uh, British journalist, spiritualist journalist at least, they started coming into America uh, from the late 1920s with Conan Doyle, you know, in that, in that era. And the, the British spiritualists kind of discovered American spiritualism. Um, one of the early visitors, Horace Leaf, sat with Ethel Post Parish, and he wrote up accounts of materialization seances in Light magazine, which you can read in 1929 and 1930. This is Silver Bell. She was described as a, a princess of the Cherokee nation. And it's thought that uh, Silver Bell was not ancient, her and her father. Her father was called Chief Bacon Rind. <laughs> I kid you not, Chief Bacon Rind. And they were thought to be Cherokee and probably from the 19th century. So relatively recent in, in, in uh, human years. Uh, it, she was called Silver Bell because of her tinkling laughter. <laughs> uh, when Ethel and Myron moved to Miami, they made some key relationships. If you look on the balcony there, the man sat down. It's almost certainly Arthur Ford. The couple standing there, I don't know, I can't expand it. There's a couple who became key figures in the life of Ethel Post and Myron. When they went to Miami, uh, Ethel and Myron met John and Mary Stefan. They met Frederick and his wife, Florence Harding, and John and Mary Reese. This is three couples. These three couples had in common the fact that they'd lost children to, the, to spirit. Through Ethel's mediumship, those children would regularly appear and materialize, and they could continue to have a, a, a relationship with them. Um, Fred Harding wrote a book called, uh, in 1932, I believe it was, um, it was called uh, The Current Status of the Post Mediumship, which is a bit of a pompous title, but it's a wonderful booklet. And next year, in my the book after this one, I'm going to republish it because it's, it contains several accounts of materialization seances with Ethel. 
Uh, so you've got three couples, all of whom have lost children, all of whom met those children again through Ethel. So you can imagine the kind of fierce loyalty that Ethel could engender. Now, the couple stand sitting in front of Arthur Ford, John and Mary Stephan. They owned, they owned a timber company in Ephrata in Pennsylvania. They were reasonably wealthy. They weren't fabulously rich, but they did own shares in the park. Which sounds a bit strange to, to, to British ears, but the park owned several buildings. They acquired the, 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 the freeholds on these properties and undertook to develop this, redevelop the site. The sites then became the center for the first Camp Silver Bell, named after Ethel's guide, of course. Uh, John and Mary Stephan died within six months of each other in 1934. And long story short, the uh, Camp Silver Bell, the trust, the fund, the, the board that controlled it, actually lost control of the property because the area is dominated by fundamentalist Christians, Amish, and they bought in and they evicted the spiritualists within six weeks of the season of 1935. This is the flag raising ceremony at the first Camp Silver Bell at Ephrata Park. And uh, there we can see everyone. These are unique photographs, really, which I've managed to source. Ethel, oh, this is the lobby at the Mountain Springs Hotel. The lobby is the foyer, as we would say in English. Uh, well, there you can see in the background the reception desk there. And behind Wendy's picture is a portrait of Ethel Post Parish on the wall there. That photograph is now in Roanoke in Virginia at the, uh, the metaphysical chapels that uh, actually own that. This is the Mountain Springs Hotel. In 1935, it was run down. It was a very big building. Uh, and really losing control of the park did Ethel and Myron a huge favor. So the people who owned this building offered it uh, as the basis for the new Camp Silver Bell. And the Mountain Springs Hotel, which dates from the 1840s, uh, became the permanent home of Camp Silver Bell. And it had a series of lodges and outbuildings, which they were able to use. And it, it proved to be an ideal. But in 1935, the Posts and their team had to take this building, get the building ready for the season, which was six weeks, and provide perfect blackout, blackout conditions for 100 people in, in the dining room. It must, <laughs> there are folk memories down at Sarasota that recall the panic around that, those events in 1935. This is a, a postcard. Postcards of the Mountain Springs Hotel are quite common. And this is one that I own. Rather nice because it gives you a coloured version of what the building looked like. And you can see through the woods on the right there, further buildings. It was in this, on Saturday night at um, Camp Silver Bell, there would be an auditorium seance. What you did, you, you booked to go to Camp Silver Bell. <clears throat> um, many events were included and some events you had to pay extra for. And the Saturday night audience, uh, auditorium seance, there was an occasion in 1960 when after Ethel's death, when 16 independent direct voice mediums sat in an auditorium sense. I mean, can you imagine the, co the cacophony of it? But what happened, of course, is that the mediums all took a turn uh, going round and the voices would come through and they would give messages to people in the audience and so on and so forth. You know, so it wasn't a cacophony at all. But uh, they called it a bizarre seance, <laughs> uh, bizarre auditorium seance, but it's bizarre in the sense of a, a marketplace. Uh, so, but I mean, the physical phenomena was just uh, extraordinary. Uh, a woman said to me in the States of long memory, she said it, it was all physical then. Uh, this is Peggy Barnes Jeffs and Ethel on the right there. Peggy, a little bit older than uh, uh, Ethel. Peggy and Ethel were best friends.
Peggy was the circle leader and uh, who controlled the events and acted. As, uh, she was also to be seen sitting to the right of the cabinet at Ethel Saints. They were they were great friends, and in common with with um, the other the couples, she too had lost family and met them regularly. Uh, she would have died for Ethel. Uh, uh, Peggy, though, had trained in business studies and was an accountant. And it was her that became the financial executive officer for Camp Silver Bell. Uh, Ethel had an eye for people, you know. As I say, if you were loyal to Ethel, she was loyal to you. This gentleman on the left is Raymond Burns. Uh, Maurice Barbonell, you know, the British psychic news editor, visited America a number of times in the mid-1930s and met Raymond Burns. Raymond Burns was an extraordinary direct voice medium. He was a direct voice medium from the 1930s up to his death in the early, 19, in the early 1970s. And he came from Buffalo. And Maurice Barbonell, you know, Buffalo is quite close to Niagara Falls. And that area, the Hayes or Ridley, for example, another American direct voice medium who gave sittings to Arthur Conan Doyle, that area, maybe because of the positive ions of the, uh, of the water of Niagara, seemed to produce an extraordinary number of direct voice mediums. And Raymond Burns is one of the, one of the principal and one of the best direct voice mediums. He came to Britain about 1953 and worked in the SAGB. This is Hugh Gordon Burroughs of Washington. He, oh, he lived into his 90s and he was a, a trance medium, quite an evidential trance medium. His mediumship was uh, mental really. He wasn't a physical medium, but it was, I mentioned earlier, billet reading. I don't know if you do it in Australia, but billet reading is where the public have a little envelope and a slip of paper and you put this a little question on the slip of paper and you put it in the envelope and you put it you write a number or something on the front you know and you put it into the basket and then the medium does this swirls them around pulls it out psychometrizes holds it to the head or whatever and gives an answer and he was very he was known for it this is Ethel on the left with her big friend uh, the lady in the middle is Mary Fulton. She was a mental medium, Canadian in birth. And the woman on the right is Bertha Eckrode. Bertha was trained by Ethel in Miami. And she was a materializing medium. And she was also a direct voice medium. Again, uh, Ethel has that uh, slightly fierce look. <laughs> there are stories of her throwing people out, out of Camp Silver Bell, whether they're true or not, who knows, but uh, there she is. And this is Jimmy Parrish. What a handsome young beau this man is, isn't he? Um, Ethel married three times. I'll tell you about the middle husband because it was a rather... Uh, Ethel married in 1905, I believe, a man called Porter Stout. Now, if you think about it, Porter and stout are two kinds of beer, are they not? Ethel, who was an elegant woman, always immaculately dressed. <laughs> I don't think she liked being called Porter or stout, and not definitely wouldn't want to be named after two beers. Anyway, she divorced. Um, she divorced stout, but she did have a son. Her only child was born through uh, with uh, Porterfield Stout. And they took the name Riley because they didn't like the name Stout either. Fresh Race Jimmy breezed into Camp Silver Bell in 1939. Uh, he was a drifter, really, but he was an opera singer and had lost his voice for some reason or th through infections and had gone and sought healing in, uh, in uh, California. And he arrived in, uh, in, at uh, Camp Silver Bell in March of 1939. Ethel, obviously, was, Ethel and Myron had, had been uh, growing estranged from one another for some years, and Ethel divorced Myron in September 1939, and she married him. She married, she married Jimmy Post, uh, Parrish. The family have been in touch with me, Ethel's descendants, 
And as you can imagine, the family regarded Jimmy Parrish as a you know, fast one on the make. Ethel was no fool, and she never, her estate remained in the family. She didn't, he was not enriched by marrying Ethel Post at all. In fact, he settled down, they had a very good relationship, and they were married for 17, 18 years and by the time she died in 1958. And when she died, and this is significant because they founded a church together, they founded an antiques business, and they bought an apartment in St. Petersburg in Florida. When she died, he had to sell the whole lot quickly within a year to avoid bankruptcy. So that's telling you that this guy did not make money out of Ethel Post Parish, but they, it, Ethel was no fool. You know, if, if it didn't work out with fresh face Jimmy Parrish, well, so what? I'll divorce this one too. But she wouldn't live with a man who, to whom she wasn't married. So she did marry him. And in fact, they had a very good relationship. But of course, the, the family didn't uh, see it quite like that. And this is their postcard. <laughs> Sorry, Christmas card. Isn't it sweet? Oh my God, the big smile. Uh, from 19th, 1940. Ethel and Jimmy outside Camp Silver Bell. This is a studio portrait of Jimmy Parrish in 19. I, I'd like to tell you about uh, her physical mediumship. This is a rare photograph, probably taken by a man, Jack Edwards, at Camp Silver Bell in 1930, uh, 19, the early 1950s. You can see there Jimmy Parrish looking a bit older, and the Peggy Barnes always in her spot there. And, Ethel <laughs> flying, levitating. In um, ooh, about 1934, 35 maybe, um, one day Silver Bell materializes and she introduces her father, Chief Bacon Rhine. And Silver Bell says, um, Silver Bell, I'm going to do something with my medium I've never done before. What, what do you mean, dear? There was a dubious tone in Mrs. Jeff's voice. My father is here tonight and he's going to materialize for you and I'm going to have him take the medium out of the cabinet so you all here can see her in a trance and then I want some people to come into the cabinet and prove it really is empty. Everyone present was warned not to touch Chief Bacon Rhine, the spirit father of Silver Bell, or the medium. Silver Bell proceed, preceded her father and held the curtain on the left open while the two figures emerged. Chief Bacon Ride, standing at least six feet three, supported the entranced body of Ethel Post Parish. Slowly, very slowly, the chief took the first step outside the cabinet. The medium's right hand hung out rigidly from her body as the two figures proceeded towards the center of the room. It reminded one of a puppeteer carrying a life-size marionette whose strings had been broken. The locomotion of the medium as she was led to the center of the room appeared to be like, like that of an automaton. A faint glow from the ruby lamp cast a strange pallor, pallor on Mrs. Post Parish's face. <laughs> How extraordinary. You can imagine a room, 40, 50 people sitting in ruby light, and here's this materialized figure carrying the body of the medium who is materializing him. What an extraordinary feat, really, isn't it? Uh, in fact, that report came from 1943. And this is Ethel, and the same, same day, probably sitting in the cabinet there. Uh, and this is an extraordinarily clear photograph with the trumpet in flight, again taken by Jack Edwards, probably, and Ethel exuding the material, the, the ectoplasm to support the, the trumpet there. There was um, Hannan Swaffer, who was a, a famous British spiritualist and medium, a socialist and spiritualist journalist. He travelled to Camp Silver Bell in the 1930s. And he sat with Ethel and his sister, Lottie, materialized. Uh, Lottie had the unique feature of uh, red hair that went right to, down to her back and she could sit on it. And Lottie materialized, called to Hannon Swaffer 
and she she literally sat down on the hair to prove that it was indeed her and this again is uh, this is um i don't think ethel is actually in this photograph but it's taken through her mediumship and here you can see four trumpets flying in the air and there's a famous sequence of photographs uh, you know, oral memory, oral history is so important. And there was a few things that uh, we were able to verify from a few sources. And there was a memory of Ethel that Ethel smoked heavily, as a lot of people did. And through the uh, through, through finding her death certificate, and then uh, death certificates in Florida don't tell you, uh, give you the cause of death. Death, but death certificates in Pennsylvania do. And I did actually manage to find an obituary that said she had chronic heart disease, almost certainly as a result of smoking. So there you get confirmation from one source, confirmation from another source. And isn't that wonderful? And Jimmy Parrish, who, who I did men who I mentioned earlier, was gay. So the, it was known, what is known as a lavender marriage, a marriage of convenience, but of, also of great affection. Um, that, also, that story also came from a number of sources and that it was remembered. Uh, J Jimmy himself died. They all kind of died within a matter of years. Ethel died 1958 in April. Jimmy died October 1964. He was only, he was, he, he was only in his 50s when he died. And Peggy Barnes, Jeff died in died in 1962. In fact, they uh, that was the day. Uh, they had a, another marriage ceremony. They got married hurriedly in the chapel in in Indiana, in, uh, in sorry, in Ohio, in, 19, in 1939. And they reenacted and they had a full wedding ceremony in 1956 at Camp Silver Bell. And here's a, a famous. I actually own a copy of this paper, the etheric double photograph. Ethel is in deep trance, and the photograph was taken by uh, Jack Edwards again. Uh, not a man that I know very much about at all, but there in the middle of the photograph is Ethel. Now, uh, Maurice Barbadell rejected the photograph, wouldn't print it. He said that the the uh, the editor the editor uh, Ralph Pressing of the new wasn't a present when it was taken, uh, so he wouldn't actually print the photograph. But Two Worlds did, in fact, print that. This is the only known photograph of Ethel's son Roland Riley, and next to him is Edith Stilwell. Uh, oh, sorry, it isn't. It's um, uh, Gladys Strom. Less said about those two, the better. And um, this is a sequence of photographs, well known really. Here's Peggy Barnes, Jeff, standing next to the entrancing medium of Ethel. And you can see the ectoplasm forming. These are obviously taken in red light. This is a slide. Can we see? Oh, there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can just see to the right there the form taking shape. It's a sequence of materialization photographs. Oh, there she is. And now we can see the form of the silver bell beginning to take shape and in the next one you see the form fully materialized as with all uh, materialization photographs they all look slightly like cut out don't they but uh, this is the best sequence of materialization photographs that uh, that i know of at least with ethel ethel died april 1958 and as i say roland's ethel wanted her uh, the things that she created to endure. So she created trust funds, the board which managed the property as he is, was a trust fund. The Camp Silver Bell Association was another was another non not for profit charitable group. But uh, Ryla Rowley, her son, took the trusts to court and won. Uh, so the trusts actually lost control of the property and Camp Silver Bell passed to the Riley family who controlled Camp Silver Bell from 1958 until its closure in 1989. The building itself, I'm afraid, was demolished in 2004. It had become a bit of a white elephant. The 
buildings were wooden, it had no central heating, uh, it had become dilapidated, it just couldn't, it was just nothing that could be done with it. And now, I don't know if you know, in America, Applebee's, there's an Applebee's. <laughs> and apparently, the, the Applebee's has lots of photographs of Camps of the 